Hi folks, welcome to part two of the HF Sequam Exciter series. The schematic may look somewhat familiar from last time. We were talking about some of the pitfalls and some of the other issues that we expected with the design. And we started with the notion that, hey, let's start with <clears throat> perhaps the biggest list of unknowns, which is the RF portion of the circuitry since largely the rest of the design is going to be borrowed from other manufacturers pre-existing products because hey I'm a broadcast engineer and I have the advantage of looking over the shoulder of some of these folks and why reinvent the wheel if you don't have to right so anyway the, f the first step we kind of were looking at was how do we build a limiter circuit that works reliably up to 30 megahertz and that's kind of the focus of this section of the video so anyway, like I said, we, we started with the schematic, kind of outlaid the way the circuit is going to work. And so the old adage is divide and conquer. So that's what we're doing today. So the first thing I did was I built this little mock-up circuit, which is just the back-end limiter. It's a pair of these uh, Schottky um, 74HC ACT14s, I think. Is that what that is? Yeah, 74 ACT14. And so this is the complete circuit. You just have a 5 volt voltage regulator so we can cram whatever's convenient in, usually about 12 volts, because that that's what my bench test supply is. And uh, through some various uh, revisions in the design, found that this was actually kind of way overkill and we had to change a couple of things, but. The moral of the story is that at 30 megahertz, we need about 500 millivolts peak to peak present at the input to this Schottky hex inverter to get a nice symmetrical square wave. <clears throat> the circuit's pretty basic. You have a transformer, and because it's a transformer, we can sort of abuse the return winding by D AC coupling the signal to ground, but also cramming a DC bias in here to put the input of this hex inverter right at its limiting point or its its equidistant point and so this this essentially allows us to adjust the symmetry of the waveform and this works pretty good so now we're going to move on to part two which is the front end amplification and filtering circuitry and we'll see how that works out so after some playing around with schematics and design and some calculations and so forth. This is the design I came up with and this is what we're going to breadboard. So the circuit we prototyped is this portion right here all the way back. So basically from the output of the TL592 which is a differential video amplifier we got enough voltage gain to get this limiter to fully recover an amplitude modulated signal and give us just the carrier phase information. So now we have to build everything else backwards. That includes the TL-592, which gives us some voltage gain about 20 times. And then we have a low-pass filter to eliminate the, uh, the spurious products that come out of the DDS because it is, after all, a digital device that is quantizing an analog signal in the digital domain so we have 125 megahertz or a 200 megahertz carrier frequency we're trying to get rid of. This filter or this amplifier, this MAR4, is here to ensure that the QAM modulators, the two balanced mixers and the power combiner see a consistent 50 ohm load regardless of what the filter is trying to do. That's the purpose of this amplifier. It also gives us about 8 dB of voltage gain, which isn't, or 8 dB of power gain, which isn't a lot, but its primary purpose is just isolation. It makes sure that the modulators see a nice balanced 50 ohm load so that they're not looking into reactances and weird things that can cause issues with the modulator. So like I said, we strip, strip the components off that we don't want, amplify it up so that this circuit can accurately see the zero crossings of the QAM waveform, and then finally spit TTL or CMOS or whatever your flavor of desire out the back. And this is the signal we need. This is what's ultimately driving the, the, uh, the downstream transmitter. So, enough yakking. Let's start building. Okay, so the first thing you want to pay attention to in any layout is where the physical parts are going to go and how much space you're going to need. 
I tend to just kind of earball it and try and figure it out on the fly. Sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes you back yourself into a corner, but here we have the advantage of looking at the circuit we already built, and we just have to duplicate some of that already. So like the limiter circuit will be there, and then of course we have this video differential amplifier that feeds the transformer, which is going to be somewhat interesting simply because most of these pins are not ground, so I'm not quite sure how we're going to hold that up just yet, but I'll figure it out. Um, this is the joys of dead bug prototyping, which, you know, for what it's worth, usually it gives you a pretty good idea as to where things are going to wind up. Alright, so here's one of the interesting things about doing this sort of uh, dead bug style breadboarding. I use three dimensions. So like the space under the sockets I'll use to run little connection wires between the pins and so forth. You see we have the input here, the output of that gate feeds three fan out type drivers to drive a 50 ohm load. And then furthermore, that side is held up by this SMA connector. So you can save a lot of space and a lot of time by running stuff underneath components and so forth. That's, that's one way to do this. Okay, so after several hours of screwing around, this is the circuit as it's constructed. So, referring to the original schematic, we've got, you know, the signal comes in, and for this purpose of discussion, we've eliminated the two modulators, and we're just feeding a signal generator input into the input of the first amplifier, which is an MAR4. Following that, it goes through a 35 megahertz low-pass filter, which is used to get rid of the DDS switching products, because after all, this is going to be fed by a DDS source, which has 200 megahertz switching products we need to get rid of. Following that, we have a TL-592, which is a differential video amplifier, and then that's transformer fed into our little Schottky hex inverter limiter thingy. <clears throat> One of the first problems that we had was well, I had when I fired the thing up is we had absolutely no vi no output out of the video amplifier I see and that's because since I'm running it off of single supply it's not the inputs are not biased at midpoint and so I had to stick some resistors out here to pull the inputs up to midpoint bias so they would actually turn on and start working once that problem was solved, I started kind of fooling around with the limiter stuff, and the problem I'm having now is that it seems like I can't get rid of the phase modulation, and it seems to be somewhat related to frequency, but even if I crank the thing up to like 6 dBm, I still have this, this flagging, and obviously if I turn the amplitude modulation off, it goes away and that seems to be kind of irrelevant to frequency so like if I go up to oops, frequency 10 megahertz and speed up the sweep a little bit you'll see the switching waveform looks pretty nice but as soon as I start throwing AM at it it gets all kind of pissy and so we're, that's at 92 percent modulation and what we need to do is figure out how to get rid of this phase modulation component because otherwise we're going to have a phase modulation component that's related to the I channel modulation which will sac which will uh, affect our modulation our our stereo separation so first order of business we need to figure out either how to get more gain out of the video op amp I see which I've already got it strapped for max gain uh, or we need to change the configuration of the limiter so that it requires less input signal to get uh, where we need to go. So work continues. Alright, so it appears that the primary problem seems to be related to the gain of the video op amp stage. Once we get beyond about 90 or 93 percent modulation, the output of that IC just drops off to nothing and you can see that here We've, this is at 93 percent modulation and as I crank it up it gets worse and worse and worse so it looks like the problem may actually be related to the gain of the stage prior to the limiter so I think this is where we're gonna leave it for now I'll pick it up later and if I have to we'll either try a different IC or we'll try a different limiter architecture but one way or the other we'll get it figured out